as we begin this morning, we are going to hear our national anthem. Oh, say can you see stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting Kevin, we'd ask that you post the colors, please, and I'm going to ask Troy to come on up here and begin our service with prayer this morning, and this is a verse we find in the book of Psalms, and we think of our nation. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Let's pray. Lord, we just come together as a family and worship you today. We just pray that your spirit go in and through us as we hear your word, as we worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we thank you for all you've done for us. We thank you for our country as we celebrate its birth this week. We pray we continue to be a Christian nation. Lord, that revival will come to our land and starts with here in this church and the churches around America. We just thank you and praise you. Again, we ask that we lift this service up to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, 
Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with the hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. Lord, we thank you so much for your holiness, and we thank you that there is forgiveness for those who repent of sin and by faith come to you. Jesus, thank you for the cross of Calvary. Thank you for shedding your blood for me, for everyone here, for all humanity. Lord, you became sin for us that we could know your righteousness. We thank you for that death on the cross. And we thank you that you were put in a borrowed tomb, just like you said you would be. And we thank you that three days later, you rose from the dead. And today we declare it again. You are the resurrection and the life. And in you, we can truly be free. Thank you for your love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you are watching via live stream, we welcome you as well. Uh, we do appreciate knowing that there are people here locally, but also in many different countries that are watching our service as it is live. Uh, we are thankful for the technology that God has given us, and uh, thank you for our media team. And we want all of you to know overseas that, that we truly see you as family. Thank you for joining us today. And um, those of you that are here, welcome. We're so happy to see each and every one of you. So Jesus said to those who had come to believe in him, if you remain in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. But they answered, we are the descendants of Abraham 
we have never been slaves to anyone. So how can you say we will become free? You see, they answer Jesus in the same way we might. I mean, we're Americans, right? We live in the land of the free. We sing songs about it. We get together and have parties and fireworks, all to celebrate our nation's freedom. But Jesus was speaking of a different kind of freedom, a freedom that can only be found in Him. He answered them, This is the truth. Everyone who chooses a life of sin isn't free. They are a slave to sin. A slave has no permanent place in the family. But a son or a daughter, they belong forever. So if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe Sing the song of ages to the land. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. Above all, all thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name.
darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you verse 31 through 34 say may the glory of the Lord endure forever may the Lord rejoice in his works he looks on the earth and it trembles he touches the hills and they smoke I will sing to the Lord as long as I live I will sing praise to my God while I have my being may my meditation be sweet to him I will be glad in the Lord I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. 
this morning and I look around and I see all the young generation singing and worshiping the Lord. We need to pray for that generation. We need to pray for these teenagers in this building this morning, for the teenagers outside in our community. We need to pray for our elementary students and our middle school students who know the Lord, who want to worship the Lord, who believe
believes that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. While school's out this summer, we need to remember to pray for them, Lord, as they are with friends more and, and outings more, Lord. Father, they are there, and they love you, and they adore you. Father, thank you for this time of worship this morning. Thank you for the voices. It's just amazing to hear. Thank you for the young generation, Father. Thank you that they are bold, that they are not afraid. And if they are, Father, they know they can come to you. And you will direct their path, Father. We just ask you be with Pastor Dave as he presents the message that you've put on his heart, Father. Let our hearts be soft and open to deliver what it is you want us to hear, Father. And let us take it forth, Father, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a couple of uh, teenagers in here today that are no longer juniors. They're now officially seniors. And that's Jaden. Come on up here. And uh, Gianna, come on up here. Anyone else that's officially a senior in high school? <laughs> in high school. Okay. So I am going to ask you to just take a good look at them and ask the Lord to direct you in how to pray for them and for all of the believers that we have in this area that are in a public school homeschool or Christian school environment. So they are representative of, of that graduating class next year, 2025. And as Nicole uh, prayed for all of our school-aged children, I want you to specifically pray for these two and for other believers in our area. Um, Jaden, uh, what an example of compassion, um, he has been there with his mother. He has a lot of younger siblings, and um, from the time that he was 10, 11, he's carrying one of them in. I mean, he has just always been a man of compassion and service, and uh, we certainly appreciate what he's doing back there with our tech. Um, and he represents Jesus Christ in the school. And Gianna is one of those individuals that you just smile when you, when you see her because of her smile. And I met her maybe four or five years ago. Three? Wow. 2021. Yeah. But um, I've watched you just really develop, especially in the area of personal worship. And you are an example to so, to so many, not just because you're up here singing, but because of what you're doing when no one is watching. And we just really appreciate the example that both of you bring into this church family. And we want you to know that we are going to be praying for you at Portville. We're going to be praying for you at Olean, and we're going to pray that God uses this summer to just really prepare you for what you're going to uh, be experiencing over your senior year. But we want both of you to know that we're, we're behind you. We are going to be praying for you. We are here to help you, and we want you to be encouraged to just be bright light and uh, flavorable salt in the area that you walk. So I'm going to ask Kevin Dent, if you wouldn't mind coming back up here again. We asked you to carry the flag. But you work in the Bolivar Richburg School District, and so you see young people all the time. And I'm just going to ask you to pray over, <laughs> pray over Jaden and Gianna this morning. And More than happy. Wow. <laughs> oh, Heavenly Father. We just take this time of prayer for Jaden. It was your name. Gianna. Gianna. Sorry, I forgot. We just ask a blessing over them this summer. As I, I pretty much got a couple of kids at Bolivar Richburg School that know I'm a Christian. They know I love the Lord. They know I love you. And I encourage them to just be a light 
in our area, Bolivar, and I pray for the same for both of them in Olean and Portville. And let them not be afraid of nothing, because we as a Christian family, we have their back. And you have our back as well. And we just ask a blessing over the summer, and um, we'll be watching. And we just ask that you cover them in your blessings, Lord, and let their light shine, because it will make a difference. We love you, and we thank you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Hi, Mom. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I always like being surprised. That's a nice greeting. Jackie, next time you come up here, you should try that kind of greeting, OK? Hey, last week we um, looked at uh, two Bible verses that you're very familiar with. I want to bring them up again. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 and 6. And we really used that as an introduction to something that I had never done before as you know if you were here. And I read the Sermon on the Mount and did so with no commentary. It didn't make sense to me when I first started thinking this through two or three months ago, but I told you I could not resist the stirring in my heart that's passed uh, the, the previous week before last Sunday, and I needed not to lean on my own understanding. And so we presented the Sermon on the Mount as Jesus gave it, as we have it translated in our English Bible, and uh, I appreciate the fact that the Lord did so much in many hearts, not just here, but, but overseas. His word is power. I made it clear that I, I did it that way because I believe that sometimes we look at preachers and teachers and worship leaders and we listen more to their commentary or we pay more attention to their eloquence or lack of it and we miss the imperatives and the uh, profoundness of God's word. I made it clear that we cannot diminish preachers, teachers, and worship leaders, and Christian leaders who are out there with their witness, because God uses humans to deliver his message. We see that throughout the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament. In fact, Paul asks the question as he writes to the church at Rome, how will they hear without a preacher? Uh, the people of Nineveh were covered with uh, guilt because of their own sin. So God sent a man, Jonah, to bring the message of God's judgment. And that message brought them to a place of repentance. And we see that throughout scripture and we see it throughout history. So please understand that in no way do I want to diminish what God's word says about teachers and preachers. And also we know they have a much greater accountability as they will stand before the Lord. We want to continue in this same realm. And probably for the next uh, four or five weeks, we're going to be looking at other messages, sermons, that are clearly presented in Scripture. This morning we're going to do that and I'm going to ask you to turn to Acts chapter 7 because we have the, the longest written sermon in the book of Acts in uh, Acts chapter 7. In fact, in the New Testament. It's a message that was given by uh, Stephen who was a servant in the early church. And we're not going to make a lot of comment on his message. I'm just going to read it through like I did the Sermon on the Mount. But we are going to make observations and conclusions about Stephen and also about the men he was preaching to. Because we see a great example of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. That's Stephen. In all your ways acknowledge him. That's Stephen. He will direct your path. That was the result of Stephen's trust and acknowledgement. 
But then we see the men he was preaching to. They were not trusting the Lord. They were not acknowledging him in this context. Instead, they were leaning on their own understanding. And it caused some grave circumstances. And it definitely shows us there is great value in looking at God's word, seeing illustrations of the very word we're looking at, and then making sure our heart is right. Uh, if God speaks to you today, again, I would encourage you, as Anne already reminded all of us, do not resist the word of the Lord. Don't let your heart get harder. Keep your heart soft before the Lord. Once again, I'm going to go back to those two verses, and I want you to read them with me as we begin. Let's do it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Now, we're going to put a little background in. Stephen, you know already from probably your own study, he was a servant in the church. He was one of seven men chosen to help with a problem that the early church was experiencing. Uh, the scripture does tell us that he was a man full of faith. He was full of the Holy Spirit. And the scripture also tells us that he had a ministry that was very public. In that public ministry, he was making uh, people who were uh, wanting to hang on to their religious positions and wanted uh, the people to always look to him, look to them for guidance. He got them upset. upset. They were pretty bent out of shape, especially because he was presenting Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they were still actively attempting to just trample on the gospel and anyone who would present the gospel. And so Stephen, out there in an open way, very public in his ministry and his witness, is now looked upon as an enemy by the religious leaders. He is um, brought into uh, an area where he would have to answer charges placed against him, which basically were all false. He was said to have been speaking against Moses and against the law and against the uh, very temple area or the synagogue area of Jerusalem. And so um, Stephen is there now before uh, learned men, before men who believe they are the uh, beginning and the end of religion. They believe that they have it all. And they are leaning on their own understanding as they are challenging Stephen now to give a defense for his faith. Lord, please help us as we listen to his sermon and Lord, help us as we look at his character and also as we look at the character of the counsel that he was speaking to. Lord, help us to make a good choice today to trust you and acknowledge you, knowing you will fulfill your promise and direct our path. Lord, keep us from leaning on our own understanding. Lord, help us to truly choose rightly today. In Christ's name I pray. Acts chapter 7. And again, we'll read the entire message and won't comment, won't stop during it. And I am trusting that the Lord will use even this that we're not actually going to open up to speak to your heart today. Imagine that you are an uh, observer. You are watching all of this take place. You're kind of in a courtroom and you are now listening to an individual give a defense for his faith. Acts chapter 7 beginning with verse 1 really sets us in this realm. Then the high priest said, are these things so? And he said, brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia 
before he dwelt in Haran, and said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives, and come to a land that I will show you. And then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke in this way that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage, I will judge, said God. And after that, they shall come out and serve me in this place. Then he gave him the covenant of circum circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob and Jacob begot the 12 patriarchs. And the patriarchs becoming envious sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all the troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now a famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And the second time, Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to the Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him, 75 people. So Jacob went down to Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, father of Shechem. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not live. At this time, Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. And when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. And the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. And when 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of, of Mount Sinai. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight and as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. Then the Lord said to him, take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now, and now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? Is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out. 
after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us whom our fathers would not obey but rejected and in their hearts they turned back to Egypt saying to Aaron make us gods to go before us as for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt we do not know what has become of him and they made a calf in those days offered sacrifices to the idol and rejoiced in the works of their own hands then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven as it is written in the book of the prophets did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Remphan, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacles of witness in the wilderness as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it, in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. That's the end of his message. Not because he chose to stop, but because of what we read next. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. I can make commentary here. They were leaning on their own understanding. But he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice. They stopped their ears. They covered their ears and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So that's Stephen giving a message to an audience that he did not choose. It was chosen for him. He did not get up in the morning. I believe he was wanting to, to serve God because he was open. He was doing signs and wonders in front of the people. He was active in his faith. But I don't think in his mind he was ready to go and speak to the high priest and to the council. When you trust in the Lord, when you acknowledge him in all your ways, God will direct your path. Stephen was on the path that had been chosen for him. For God had a message to give to the people 
who had said they represented God, but yet in reality had closed their heart to the living God. And so Stephen was right where he should be at that moment in time. Knowing that, I want to make this little comment here. Sometimes when we know what's ahead of us, when we know according to our plans that we're going to be uh, having an opportunity to share our faith somewhere, we will take opportunity to plan and prepare. That's what I would do. And we would get away and we would spend time with the Lord. We would be in his word and we would just want everything there to show preparation uh, was serious and a message was given that was from the word of God so it could touch hearts. I don't believe Stephen had a lot of time to prepare. How is it then that he could deliver this kind of of detailed message. Obviously, two things, and we're going to look at both of them more toward the end, but he was full of faith, and faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. He was in the word. Secondly, he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Remember that, because that actually is going to be how we close as we bring it up to the vernacular as we bring it up to our present time. Let's look at a few uh, observations, some conclusions here. First of all, Stephen had a good reputation and a good name. Stephen was in the place he was in because of that. He was chosen by the people in the church after prayer and they're looking. Stephen was one of seven people that the church saw as being able to do a job that, that was important that had come up because of a problem. We need to recognize how valuable a good name is in our generation today. The way you and I live our lives is absolutely important. We need to have that character that people can look at and say, that's a good name. Or they bring favor. This is what Proverbs chapter 22 verse 1 says. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. Loving favor rather than silver and gold. A lot of people spend a lot of time going after material things and money and all of that stuff. When the best and the most valuable thing that we could possess is a good name. And keep this in mind. Daisy and I remind each other of this all the time. We wear the name of our Savior. We bear the name of Jesus. Wow, do we have to make sure we bring honor to that name. Secondly, Stephen uh, was dependable and he helped alleviate a problem in the church. Acts chapter 6, verses 5, 6, and 7. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. And notice, verse 7, then the word of God spread. And the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Man, this, was, this is powerful. Once these seven men were in place, and they were to alleviate a problem that existed in the church by serving everyone in a timely way, then the word of God just, just went out even more than it had. Trusting and acknowledging God should always put us in a place of promoting unity in the church. Not just our local church, but in the church. If we are trusting God with all of our heart, we are acknowledging him in all of our way, he's directing our path. And if we are all doing that, that promotes unity. Unity then solves problems. Unity 
becomes a catalyst for spreading God's word. So, a couple questions here for us. Are we unifiers? Are we problem solvers? If we're leaning on our own understanding, we are going to be conflicted and, and we are going to be divided. But if we are trusting in the Lord with all of our heart and acknowledging him in all of our ways, he is going to be working in each life and that is going to bring unity. Stephen helped alleviate a problem in the church. I hope that each one of us could do the same thing if called upon. Number three, Stephen was open and active in his faith. Acts chapter 6, verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. And it's important for us to remember this. Stephen was not an apostle. He wasn't set aside uh, by the word of God that we're reading as an evangelist. Or he was an administrator. He was a servant. He was a problem solver. He was not known necessarily for his preaching or teaching. The reason why he was becoming prominent in the church is because of his service. So that the apostles could preach and teach more. So that the, the gospel could go forth. So Stephen really was a common individual. And yet he lived out his faith in real time. I want to say this as clearly as I can. Don't let warped thinking and understanding manipulated by human logic and fear keep you from being a Holy Spirit enabled and equipped follower of Jesus Christ. Amen. When we have that warped thinking... We look at other people, yeah, they've, they're gifted, they're doing that, yeah, well, they, they can do that. Listen, when we allow that kind of thinking to go forward, it diminishes then the power of God that we've been singing about this morning. It diminishes it in our lives. We need to recognize that when we lean on our own understanding and we limit our opportunities or we don't take them because of our own warped understanding, we are going to miss out on giving people life and hope, which will bring us great blessing in itself. You and I may not be what we would call prominent, eloquent speakers and what, what people would be drawn to. But we don't have to be. We just need to be individuals who trust in the Lord with all of our heart and we are acknowledging him in all our ways, knowing he's going to direct our path. And wherever then he leads us, we then know that when we have that opportunity, it's right there in front of us that the Spirit of God is going to enable us and equip us and even bring back to memory things that we didn't think we remembered and we will give the word of God. We may think that we struggle and stumble with it, but an, a Christian, a follower of Christ, following God, directed in that perfect place at the perfect time, is going to see if they are surrendered to the Holy Spirit, God using them as an instrument, and people will hear the good news from you. That is what Stephen was doing. Now, that did lead him to become the first martyr of Christ. In the gospel of, uh, or in the uh, book of Acts. I mean, we know that did take place. But that wasn't the rule for the thousands of people at that time that had come to Christ. You never know what God may ask you to do. But isn't it nice to know that Stephen, even in that place, did not cry out in horror or fear. Instead, the glory of God was seen by him, and we see him with great compassion, the same kind of compassion Jesus Christ had on the cross of Calvary. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Stephen is doing the same thing. I do not believe he woke up that morning thinking those would be his final words. 
but he trusted in the Lord with all of his heart. He was acknowledging God in everything and God directed his path and God used him to where we're being inspired by his example today. Amazing thing. Stephen knew the word of God and the Holy Spirit assisted him. That message that he gave, I mean, that was the word of God. That was the Old Testament. That was the very words that the uh, false accusers were saying he didn't believe. He knew the word. He didn't have a text in front of him. He didn't have notes that he carried in from weeks of preparation. The Spirit of God spoke through him because he knew the word and he had the sword of the Holy Spirit. Listen, we talk about having the armor of God on all the time and we know that the only offensive part of that armor armor is the sword of the spirit. Doesn't it make sense then that we as God's people need to be doing two things? We need to be in the word. We need to be digesting the word. We need to hide the word in our heart that we may not sin against God, but we also need to know the word so that we can at the right time under the spirit's control, give the word to people who need to hear words of comfort, words of challenge, words of instruction, words of advice. And in Stephen's case, words of judgment and challenge, conviction. We must recognize it's not enough for us to say, yeah, I, I'm carrying the sword of the spirit, but then not use it. We need to always have that weapon ready. It is the word of God and it is the spirit's uh, enablement and equipping that will allow us to do what God wants us to do in the daily battle we face. And then Stephen was a man of prayer. The last thing we see him doing is praying. He's fallen on the ground. He's kneeling. He's getting ready to actually die. But he is asking God, please forgive them. And he is asking God to take him. And he is thanking him in that moment. We, I'm convinced, will do in the end of our days what we've been doing all along. If we are given to prayer, we are going to be on our deathbed in prayer. Because that's who we are. Stephen just didn't make it up. Hey, they might write this down. I want people to think good of me. He's not even thinking about that. This is who he was, a man of prayer. And how powerfully that can speak to you and me today. We need to be people always praying. What did Paul say? Pray without ceasing. That means we're just always in this attitude of prayer wherever we are. That was Stephen. So we see Stephen clearly a man who was trusting in God with all of his heart. He was acknowledging God in all of his way and God was directing his path. But then we also see these council members. They absolutely were leaning on their own understanding. And because of that, they did what Stephen said that their forefathers had done by killing the prophets. They killed the bearer of good news and hope. They knew the word. They wore the word on their wrist, on their foreheads. They quoted it. They were out in public. But they had their own wisdom and understanding that they leaned on. We know it did not work out well for them in the end. So what about you? What about me? What about us? As we consider the verses again, are we truly trusting in the Lord with all of our heart, acknowledging him in all of our ways, or are we allowing our own evaluation, our own human understanding to guide our steps, and we sometimes will bring in the name of Jesus to give our choice some kind of cover or some kind of image for other people to see. If we do that, it will not bring any kind 
of success or hope. Let's choose wisely. Father, help us as we go through our remaining moments to examine our hearts and evaluate where we are uh, by the Spirit bringing your word to us. Lord, if there's conviction, I pray that we would respond to it. Lord, if there's comfort, may we embrace it. Lord, if we need, con um, we need uh, wisdom to replace the confusion that we have in our life, Lord, help us to believe it. Lord, we're asking that you would do your work right now as only you can do. You are holy. Lord, you are the God above all gods, the king above all kings. You are the king of the universe. And Lord, our part is to trust you. So Lord, look at my heart today. Look at the hearts of your people here. Lord, I pray that you would find a heart that is just passionate for you and your word. Lord, I pray that we would be followers of Jesus as, as Stephen was. Lord, to be ready to do whatever you ask us to do. Lord, I pray that that would lead to unity in our home and unity in the church. Lord, I pray that it would make us as problem solvers instead of dividers. Lord, I pray that you would remind us that we have your word. We have the, the spirit inside of us to take that word and to use it in, an, in a way that can bring us into the battle as victors, even more than conquerors. Lord, we're praying that we would have a good name, a good reputation in the area because we're trusting you. Lord, we pray that people would even see our good works and give glory to you, our Father in heaven. Lord, we need you to help us. Lord, we pray that we would speak the word with accuracy. We pray that we would become men and women of prayer. We pray that our hearts would be for the lost and dying in this world that you died to redeem. And Lord, as we were reminded as we ended our Sunday school time today, help us to go out then and do the work to speak the truth because you are with us. Your word is true. Lord, thank you for reminding me again how important it is for me to let go of my logic and understanding and accept your word as my guide and my compass. Lord, I pray that you would be with anyone here today who does not know you as their personal savior. Please, Lord, let them know how much you love them. Lord, as they just recount the words that have been spoken or the words that we've sung, Jesus, you died on that cross to pay the penalty for our sin. You were buried three days later, you rose from the dead and you have said, come unto me all you labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Jesus, I pray that people will repent, that people will turn from sin, turn to you today and that you will set them free because if the son sets us free, we are free indeed. Thank you for your word. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you today need to make that decision for Christ, please seek one of us out. We would love to just talk with you more, pray with you. You can accept Christ wherever you are, even right now. If you confess and repent of your sin and believe that Jesus Christ died, buried, and rose again for you, and by faith receive that free gift of eternal life, he's yours. We'd love to pray with you. Love to talk with you. If you're here today as a believer, man, let's, let's keep trusting God and let's make sure it's with our whole heart. And let's acknowledge him in all the ways, even when it's hard. It was not easy for Stephen to be arrested and to be dragged in front of the council and then had false witnesses speak against him. That would not have been something he would have chosen or any of us would choose. But Lord, he acknowledged you in that place. 
and you gave him great boldness. And he is an example of a Christ follower today. So, Lord, help us now as we go through this closing moment. Remind us of your holiness. In Christ's name, we pray. Hey, if you need prayer this morning, we have people that would pray with you and for you. Tony's up here. Uh, Carolyn's here. I mean, if any of you need prayer, please um, just let uh, these people know. Anyone that's in the auditorium, they'd be happy to just go somewhere even privately and, and pray over you or pray with you. If you need to make a decision for Christ, please let us know. We want you to know that we are here to help you see Jesus in all of his resurrection life and power. Hey, let's just go out this morning recognizing how holy our God is. We're going to sing just that last verse of holy, holy, holy. Let's stand as we sing.